Well, good evening. Good to have you back with us. Those of you on uh, social media, good to have you following along with us. Our first song this evening is going to be number 345. 345. It is well with my soul. Three, four, five. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is for an opening prayer.
Dear Lord, we thank thee, Father, Father, for this beautiful day that was given to us. We thank thee for the rain that I was also refreshed the earth with. We have so many things to be thankful for, Lord. Thank thee for uh, the institution of marriage and blessing us with children. Um, above all, we thank thee for uh, our Savior Jesus and his blood that washes away our many sins. Thank thee for uh, this congregation that meets here. Uh, we're mindful of all those that are traveling at this time. Pray for their safety, that they'd reach their destination without uh, fear or harm coming to them. Uh, we thank thee for our preacher and good mind he has and uh, for the Holy Scriptures to guide us until that great day when Jesus comes again. And pray that thou would help us all to uh, remain faithful uh, until that time. In Jesus' great name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our next song is number 684, 684. Six hundred eighty four. This world is not my home. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Amen. Our next song will be number 542. 542. Purer in heart, O oh God. Following this song, we'll have our prayer list. 542. <clears throat> Purer in heart, O oh God, help me to be. Guide me with count. 
counsel sweet, pure in heart, help me to be pure in heart, O oh God, help me to be. Teach me to do thy will most lovingly. Be thou my friend and guide. Let me with thee abide. Pure. That I thy holy face one day may see. Keep me from secret sin, reign thou my soul within. Pure. time we'll have our prayer list. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for another beautiful day that we can come together to worship you and to fellowship with each other. Father, the Apostle Peter has told us to give our cares and concerns to you because you care for us. So we now ask you to bless the following people with your loving presence and your healing power. We ask for Goldie Neal, for Tom Mills' mother, for Marge Cooper, John Buck, Eula Rhodes, Meredith Standard Shepherd, Randy McCord, Jewel Coppinger, Nancy Evans and Pam Munn, Betty Standridge, David M. Uh, Cleta Sisk, Moselle Curtis, Doug Sandridge, Gary Ratcliffe, Glenda Fry, Casey Case Jr. We thank you also, Father, for the good health that uh, we all have here today. We ask you to grant us your wisdom, your strength, your endurance and guidance in the days ahead. In your son's holy name we pray, amen. amen. Song before our sermon this evening will be number 619, 619. Six hundred nineteen, take time to be holy. Take time to be holy, speak oft with thy Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek. Take time to be holy, the 
world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide. And run not before him, whatever be tied. In joy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. Thus led by his spirit to fountains of love, thou soon shall be fitted for service above. Mark in your books, number 655. 655 will be our song of invitation after our lesson this evening. 655. This is our last service together this year, uh, at least in a, a, a worship capacity. We've been looking at leadership and leaders in the Old Testament. We looked at the judges. We looked at men like Samuel. We've looked at a few of the kings. And tonight, as we kind of conclude this, uh, this series, I want to kind of look at a big picture view of why it's so important that we have people step up and be good leaders. And one of the best examples that I can think of of that is the nation of Israel, especially during the time of the divided kingdom. Now, at the close of uh, <clears throat> Solomon's reign, he gives control of the nation to his son Rehoboam. And unfortunately, Rehoboam didn't follow in his grandfather's footsteps, but was a little bit closer to his father's footsteps and not always respecting God and respecting the ways that he should. And Rehoboam made enemies. Now, God had already, we, had, we need to be clear about this, God had already promised Solomon that he was going to take the kingdom, at least in part from him because of his failings, especially in the, in the form of idolatry. But we have the rise in the northern kingdom of men like Jeroboam, who leads a coup, takes the northern ten tribes, and begins the northern kingdom of Israel, leaving Judah essentially alone in the southern kingdom. Now Jeroboam was not a godly man. In fact, he was so selfish, and you, today we might even use the term narcissistic, 
and that he was worried that if he did not do something to prevent it, that Israel would continue to go to Jerusalem for worship and therefore weaken his kingdom. And so instead what he did is he established in Dan and in Bethel sites of idolatrous worship. Not necessarily pagan worship, at least it did not begin that way, but it was idolatrous. And we need to understand that there is a difference between those two things. What happened at the base of Mount Sinai was idolatrous, but it was not pagan. What happened at Dan and Bethel was idolatrous, but not pagan. In those instances, Jeroboam must have been reading the Exodus because he decided that what he was going to do was cast two golden calves and put one, put one, both uh, one each in Dan and Bethel in <clears throat> in temples, and he established a false uh, priesthood to lead Israel in worship. Now. It began as an idolatrous version of Judaism. What I mean by that is originally the idea was much like what we see the Israelites doing at the base of Mount Sinai. The the bulls or the, the calves were meant to take the place of God in a physical form. They were not new gods. They were not foreign gods. It was supposed to be representative of Jehovah, but it was not obviously right regardless. So great was Jeroboam's sin in introducing this idea of idolatrous worship that subsequently in describing the various kings of Israel, it became commonplace to just say that they followed in the sin of Jeroboam, meaning they too were idolatrous. And then we can see a man, Ahab, the son of Omri, in 1 Kings chapter 16. And this is a big deal because remember, there have been lots of kings between Jeroboam and Ahab, and they have almost all continued in the sin of Jeroboam and have added to it and have introduced truly pagan worship But in verse 30 of 1 Kings chapter 16, it says, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Here's my favorite line, though. Maybe my favorite verse in all of the Old Testament. And it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. Remember, I said that God used that phrase, walking in the sins of Jeroboam, to categorize them as idolatrous. And what God is saying is that Ahab, he's like, man, Jeroboam's got nothing on me. For it was a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, so that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. He married a foreign woman who was wicked as they come, and together they introduced the worship of Baal, or Baal, to Israel. This continues on through the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom from Jeroboam the first, and we need to, I mean, I want to be clear about this because there's often a, there's a second Jeroboam that ruled, and sometimes he's referred to as Jeroboam II or Jeroboam the second. They were not actually related to each other. It's just they shared the same name and there needs to be a way to tell the two apart. But Jeroboam II, also a wicked king, all the way up to the end in 2 Kings Second Kings chapter 17, when Hosea, the son of Elah, became king of Israel in Samaria and reigned nine years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, only not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Not as bad. He did evil, just not as much evil. 
but he would be the last king. As not one king in all of Israel's history ever tried to undo the sins of Jeroboam. Not one king ever tried to drive the northern kingdom back to God in a proper way. And in fact, we see here, as the king of Assyria takes Israel captive, scattering them abroad and filling the land with foreigners, that God also records for us the beginning of a new nation one that features prominently in the New Testament, that of the Samaritans. As this people who are already so used to defying God's word, already so used to false worship, idolatrous worship, even pagan worship, intermarried with those people brought in by the king of Assyria and became a new race, a new people's still sort of attached to Judaism, still sort of attached to God, but a people's very much hated by the Israelites who will later return because of their unwillingness to come back to God. There is a slight contrast in the southern kingdom. I say slight because you still only have about five kings in the southern kingdom of Judah whoever tried to do what was right in the sight of God. Now, most of them never ascended to the... Most did not ascend to the level of their northern counterparts. Most were not as idolatrous, not as wicked, but some were But we do see those flashes, especially during the reigns of two men, Hezekiah and Josiah. As these two men led large-scale revivals in Israel, Hezekiah doing so for a couple of different reasons, but not, not in a small way due to the threat of Assyria capturing the northern kingdom and even besieging the city of Jerusalem. Sometimes, by the way, good things can come out of very bad things. I don't want to say that, that there's a silver lining to every cloud, because sometimes the clouds are just black. But good can come. Because Hezekiah is able to beseech God, and in so doing, save Jerusalem from destruction and lead a revival of his people back to God, back to worship, back to cleansing the temple and reappropriating it for its proper use and with the proper people and all of these things. And and he does this and God is pleased with it and he blesses Judah for it. Unfortunately, then there is a, a line of kings who kind of subsequently don't hold up there into the bargain until you get to Josiah. Josiah led the largest attempt to return to God that we see in the pages of the Old Testament prior to the captivity. I say it that way because men like Nehemiah and Ezra and others rebuild the temple, rededicate it, rebuild the city of Jerusalem, and and really begin Israel down that path. But it's during the reign of Josiah, and it's not, and we have to be clear about this, it's not just the strength of Josiah, but as they say, as leadership goes, so goes the nation, or so goes the congregation. And, And the Bible bears this out. That without strong leadership, people will become adrift. They will find their own ways, and it's usually not good. But a man named Hilkiah, the high priest, and Saphan, a scribe, 
found the book of the law. And I want you to think about that. You see, because the priests and the scribes, their job was to take care of the word of God. The scribes' job was to reproduce the scriptures because, of course, as we mentioned this morning in our Bible class, ancient methods of writing and ancient papers and ancient things, they didn't last very long, especially with usage. And so they would have to be replaced on a fairly regular basis. And this led to these men, these scribes, being employed, essentially, to recreate copies of the Old Testament. The priest's job was to teach people. It wasn't just to offer sacrifices. It wasn't just to tend to the temple. It was to teach the people the law of God. That was their job. And here we have the high priest and the scribe finding the book of the law. That's how bleak it was. They didn't even know where the Bible was. Think about that. This is not a time when every Israelite has a copy of Scripture in their home. In fact, almost nobody would. This is not a time even of synagogues. This is a time where the only place to get such instruction is from the priests. And they didn't even know where the law was. But it wasn't just that these men men found it. It's that they had the devotion to God. They had the strength. They had the guts to take it to the king and say, you need to hear this. This is a dangerous thing to do. Remember, these kings have not been good. Not as bad as their northern counterparts, but not good. And by reading this book of the law, they're going to challenge the king that, you know what? Neither you nor anyone else in, in Judah is doing right by God. And that might not go over very well. But thankfully, it was Josiah. Or maybe more, more accurately, thankfully, Josiah had a good heart. Because Josiah hears the book of the law And in 2 Kings chapter 22 and verse 11, he tears his clothes in mourning for what has been going on. And he tells them to go because he knows that the, the the anger of the Lord is burning against Israel. And he says, you go and you find the priests and you find the elders and you make sure they follow this book. Chapter 23 speaks of Josiah's covenant with God, speaks of the reforms that he led in clearing out idolatrous false priests, in tearing down idolatrous uh, sites of worship, in in, in reestablishing the proper priesthood and worship within the temple. And it says that he reinstituted the Passover. And in chapter 23 and verse 22, it says something else that is so shocking to me. It says, Surely such a Passover had not been celebrated from the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and of the kings of Judah. Josiah led... Israel in observing the feast of the Passover properly for the first time ever. Including during the reigns of Saul, David, and Solomon. He 
Israel had not upheld the Passover properly. Not since the days of the judges, it says. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was observed to the Lord in Jerusalem. Leadership makes a difference. More accurately, leadership that is focused on doing what is right in the sight of God rather than being man-pleasing is extremely important. Because we can get used to doing things the wrong way. We can get used to not giving God what he is due. Unfortunately, the evil influence of his predecessors the evil influence of so many things would mean that after Josiah's death, Israel, or excuse me, Judah, would be sentenced to destruction. Because unfortunately, Josiah's own son did worse than anyone before him, undoing much of his father's work in reestablishing idolatrous worship. It would only be a few short years before Babylon would come and take away the kingdom of Judah as well. And that is a story in itself, the story of Josiah and his son Manasseh. And even there, how diligent we have to be to teach the why and not just the what. Because it only takes one generation. Many things are done slowly. Things creep in. Changes are made. But not everything happens that way. If there's not good leadership, it can happen almost overnight. And so we have to be concerned not about just being good leaders for ourselves and for today, but in building good leaders for tomorrow. Lord willing, we'll talk more about that next week as I lay out some plans for next year. I would have liked to spend maybe a little bit more time on this subject, but it is what it is. I would encourage you, look at these passages, look at the books of First and Second Kings, and look at just how important good leadership is. And I want to be clear about something else, just, just briefly, is that even in the days of these kings, even in the days of men like Ahab, it's not as though Israel was without good leadership. Because it was during the days of Ahab that Elijah walked the earth, and Elijah and Ahab battled, and I mean that literally, they battled, for the length of both of their lives. it's all the more 
reason that we need to be careful. Because a a standard of poor leadership was so ingrained in the northern kingdom that even a man like Elijah couldn't turn them around. Think about that. Brethren, we owe God more than that. And that's really what it comes down to. Is when we respect God, when we understand what he's done for us, and when we desire to do what is right for him and to him because of that love, devotion, and respect, that's when good leadership is born. When we become ungrateful, when we become prideful, that's when things go astray. And so I hope that we can all continue on in the years to come and continue to grow in our leadership, continue to grow in these principles that we've discussed. And, and I'm thankful for the advent of technology that even if we don't revisit this topic together again soon, we can always go back anytime we want and revisit it. And so I'll close going all the way back to Joshua, one of the first leaders. Echo the words of God when he told Joshua, or when Joshua challenged Israel, I should say, that we have to choose today who we're going to serve. And then we have to choose tomorrow who we're going to serve. And every day after that. And I hope and I pray that we will all choose to serve God with every fiber of our being Choose the route of humility and sacrifice and service. And that the church will be better off for it. If we can help you in this, if we can assist you in being more like Hezekiah, being more like Josiah, being more like Elijah, being a better leader, being a better Christian, and being a better servant. Let us do that for you. If we can help you tonight, please let us know as we stand and as we sing. There's a fountain free just for you and me. Let us haste, oh haste, to its brink. Tis the fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Is a fountain open for all. There's a living stream with a crystal gleam from the throne of life. Now it flows while the waters roll. Let the weary soul hear the call that forth freely goes. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul.
Good evening, everyone. So a few announcements before we're dismissed. Remember, we have a Bible Bowl that's coming Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and it's going to be on numerals of the Bible. So sit up on all your numerals. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, the youth Bible camp that was scheduled for up at YBC starting tomorrow was canceled due to some big storm that's getting ready to come in tonight. So due to the safety concerns, they canceled the youth camp up there at YBC. So... If you weren't aware of that, that's been canceled for this week. Um, let's see, a men's business meeting coming up on January 11th. We have our birthday fellowship on the 23rd. And it's, I believe it's stews, soups and stews, if I remember right. Let's remember that we have uh, our morning Bible worship at uh, 9.30 this next coming Sunday and 10.30 worship. Is there anything else before we're dismissed? If you're willing and able, please stand for a closing prayer. <clears throat> Dear God, Father in heaven, we're so thankful, Lord, for another day that you bless us with to come to worship you, to sing songs of praise, to study more from your word, and to remember your son and his love for us by partaking of the Lord's Supper remembering his sacrifice, his perfect sacrifice, giving us a chance to forgive us of sins and eternal life. We're so thankful for the lesson that we've heard today. <clears throat> we pray, Lord, that, that you'll be with us in this next coming year, that you will help us to be better leaders. We know that leadership is what you desire, to be better disciples for you. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to be, to be those leaders, to help us to be that shining light upon the hill that those that are around us will see that light and will be led to you. We pray that you'll be with us in the rain of this week, be with those who are with us that are going to be traveling throughout these, this holiday week, and we pray that you'll be safe, keep them safe travels. We pray that you'll be with those who are on our prayer list, keep them healthy, keep them safe, and be that will, and be with those who are comforting them. Be with us now until the next time we uh, meet together. Keep us healthy and safe. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.